is Director of Government Technology Strategy for CrowdStrike. He's also a fellow with CSIS and used to be a policy analyst at Business Executives for National Security. He has a great deal of direct experience with both Japanese and Chinese cyber issues. Mr. Sheldon is degrees from George Washington University and Champlain College. Welcome aboard. Thank you for coming. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, everyone's keeping us on schedule, so I'll, I'll take that as a dare not to go too much over. Um, let me talk for a moment about CrowdStrike uh, before getting into some of the substance first. I think probably some of you have heard of the company, or at least I hope so. Um, if you have, it might be because of the intelligence work that CrowdStrike does. Uh, we have a uh, group of foreign linguists looking at military doctrine and organizations of intelligence services uh, across Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, some of the everybody's favorites, also a lot of other countries that uh, are increasingly in the game, uh, and also trolling around criminal forums and that sort of thing. Um, so probably you've seen some reports about that, or again, at least I hope. Uh, CrowdStrike also has incident response services and uh, in increasingly um, uh, like influential and, and uh, significantly adopted endpoint protection uh, a product as well. And that's the type of thing that uh, we'll probably talk about today as we talk about um, a federal IT and modernization. So uh, I'm a technology strategist at CrowdStrike, which is to say I get the uh, good, good pleasure of being able to sit with people in the, in the public sector and just really understand their use cases and help them find, uh, find pathways to do that. Um, so we talk a lot about you know, controls, you know, FedRAMP and that sort of thing. Um, making sure that everybody gets the solutions that they need uh, under the constraints that they have. So uh, that being said, I thought um, it might be worthwhile to, to ask a question that I've been thinking about recently, which is um, on, on the question of like life, the service life. So does anybody remember the, the article, The Pentagon's Wasting Assets? Is that something that, that resonates here at all? There was a, yeah, so, yeah. so uh, this, this is something that's, that's probably worth uh, revisiting. It's by Andy Kravinevich. It came out in um, uh, Foreign Affairs in like 2009. And it's, a, it's an influential piece, I think, uh, in, in, in my thinking, certainly. And I think it, people in the defense analytical community have looked at this. And I think it's relevant in this domain. So the premise of the article is that you, you, know, you design a bunch of things, you have a very long service life for them, and then at a certain point, their utility starts to erode. And um, it should not be the case that we expect a linear erosion of that utility. It's like something's useful for a point, and then it's all of a sudden, it's much, much less useful. So you can think about this in terms of ships that are designed 30 years ago, uh, before there's new types of weapon systems. I can think about it in terms of fighter aircraft, bombers, that sort of thing. Um, it's also the case that it's just like, if you train people on one threat and that threat goes away or changes or becomes less significant than another threat, then um, all your analysts are kind of wasting assets or at least their subject matter expertise. Um, I think about this uh, in the IT space because there is nothing that changes more rapidly than, than IT. You know, we've all come to event, we've been in this space for a long time. We've all been, you know, hearing about cloud and how wonderful that is and how important it is. And, I, I would, you know, the first person to agree with that. But we've been hearing about that for 10 years, so it's not like things change every single day, but the point is that there's a ton of innovation happening all the time. And when you have, leg when you have legacy equipment and legacy security solutions in particular, you expect a, a, an erosion of the utility that they offer. So um, that's something that's important for folks, I think, in, in the military space and in the government space. To, to try and keep track of and understand that they're incorporating the newest technologies from the private sector into their enterprises and making sure that they're leveraging them correctly. Now, everyone understands that in the federal space, you don't have you know you don't have the, the sort of fast cycles where you can have a lot of significant change over in the way that you get in the in the private sector. Um, things many in many instances might take a year or two years or three years to build or buy. So. Uh, I think it's important for federal uh, acquisition folks and for leaders in government, people who own cybersecurity risk and, and, and uh, IT, to really do a good job of paying attention to the trends that are taking place in the private sector and making sure that as new technologies emerge, that they have mechanisms to bring those into the, into the enterprise and doing it in a way that um, like 
is flexible enough so that not every, it's, it's like not the case that you have to start over. If you're an innovative private sector company, you don't have to start over again and sort of show your chops. Like people in government should learn a lot more from I think how um, like how folks in the private sector like where where they've gone, what directions they've gone to. So I tell people all the time, um, you have an enterprise security challenge in DoD. You have it all across the federal government space. It's not a whole lot different from the the challenges that you find in the financial sector, in the energy sector. Everyone has some very specific use cases. Everyone has some very specific constraints. Um, there's a scale issue that DOD grapples with that um, not a lot of folks in the private sector would necessarily. But some of the fundamentals are the same. Um, and then and also the threat actors and the types of threats are the same. So we see folks all the time at CrowdStrike, we see the same threat actors targeting small think tanks and you know, Fortune 100 companies, as we see, uh, trying to breach government networks, and because the threat, because threats are so similar, you can sort of understand because you have the benefit of seeing these fast, rapid development acquisition cycles in the private sector, how to you know how to move some of those technologies over. So I tell people, if there's a like if there's a special you know technology out there to you know to defend this stuff, it should be able to prove itself in the private sector, and you can in fact learn more about reading uh, like what the best security technologies are by reading a Gartner or a Forrester report, um, then you can learn from getting some sort of specialized brief in a skiff somewhere because uh, everyone who has enterprises exposed is exposing themselves to that same category of threats. And some people, when I you know when I make that assertion, nod and they, they, they get that intuitively. Some folks say prove it, um, but it's pretty straightforward if you're running a, if you're running an enterprise uh, to you know to do like hopefully do a test in that environment and make sure that everybody is sort of getting that message. So uh, that's kind of a like it's kind of a couple of general points about um, wasting assets. So let me let me pivot now and just talk briefly about um, the importance of threat hunting because this is something that we also um, like we also spend a lot of time advocating for. So um, we heard in, the, in a previous presentation you know the assertion that that it might take a year to deploy patches, right? That, that's sometimes optimistic. So it's very frequently the case that you have organizations where you have equipment that's temporarily out of service. There's construction, there's construction happening in a wing. Uh, people are traveling. They don't get their patch deployments. Um, and you hear people talk about, well, we've now reached the end of service life for the operating system that you know some critical application depends on. And there's always some intent to migrate that sort of thing to the cloud so that eventually you can get off whatever dependencies you have. Um, so you either have a hard time deploying patches to where you need them, or you find yourself in a situation where the, the operating systems or other, other systems that are critical are not being serviced anymore. So what are you supposed to do? Um, we say that <laughs> at CrowdStrike that if 80% if of current efforts um, are based on hygiene, like looking at different controls, trying to spread them out, uh, looking at compliance for controls, that's that's like fine in the sense that all those things do need to be done, but if that only leaves twenty percent of your aggregate efforts for doing hunting, and here I'm talking about instrumenting your environments so that you can go in and look for indications of uh, compromise, indications of attack from adversaries, finding what's happened, understanding the prevalence of, of those sorts of uh, events and the, the provenance of them, making sure that when you identify gaps, closing them, um, you, you, know, you you might not be allocating your time correctly. We say, in fact, you should probably spend more like 80% of your time doing that hunting and 20% of your time uh, doing things that are more hygiene related. And that is, you know, like heresy to some to some people who spend a lot of time working on, on compliance, but it's supposed to, it's supposed to refocus everyone's attention on what really counts and where you, where you get results. Um, so let me, let me then just Talk uh, about you know what, what we've seen recently you know government on the on the cloud front because some of what I described you know instrumenting your environment correctly making sure that you're doing a hunting mission in a way that's likely to pick up indications of malicious activity from uh, from cyber like temporary cyber threat actors is going to be reliant on having cloud architectures so you know. We take it for granted that not everybody's going to be have everything. It's going to have everything on the cloud because of the legacy infrastructure problem that I referenced. But we hope that people start pointing the ship in that direction and just recognizing that it will take a while to get there. So, um, if you have a security solution which is cloud-based, um, if you have other like uh, uh, 
other management infrastructure, which is which is cloud based, you can then at least get the best coverage area you can within your network, within your domain, and you can enable yourself to hunt across the broadest, um, or the biggest breadth of your environment as you can, and you're more likely to be able to take the scale that you have, and instead of being hobbled by that, um, to the extent that you can make it uniform by having you know cloud-based infrastructure, um, you can you, you can turn that scale into an actual asset because now you have a much richer context from which to um, like my information and, and you know, I reference uh, prevalence. It's great to know if something is happening on your network, whether it's happening everywhere on your network because one of your application providers made a change and it, something's implemented in a strange way and it, and it looks suspicious, or because it is a threat actor doing something that's completely novel. So, some like having a, having a cloud architecture supports being able to understand how prevalent something is. So, um, we've seen a ton of interest in the federal space and you know moving to cloud. It's been very encouraging in the intelligence community and in the Department of Defense in particular to see efforts like uh, GovCloud, C2S, SC2S, and it's going to be so interesting. Like at, at this point. It's going to be so interesting to look at, like now, now that some of those things are taken for granted, and some of the other efforts that are stood up in the Defense Department specifically, to see how quickly they can, you know, move some of those critical applications into those environments. Um, you know, we hope that that some of the security mission goes there, and that people are creative in how they construe like what the opportunities are. It's not just your business process stuff that, that needs to go there. It's actual, it's actual mission, and it can be mission for, it can be mission for. The CIO and CISO organization as much as it can be for the warfighter. So uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I appreciate it.